All right, so today we're going to talk about the dynamic notch filter and pull back the curtain on how it works. Well, first things first, let's talk about how to turn on the dynamic notch filter. Hopefully you know this already, but obviously you connect to Betaflight and you go down to the configuration tab and you slide down to your features and it's right here and you go ahead and toggle it on. You hit save and reboot and then go to your PID tuning tab, filter settings, and what I recommend is turning off static notch filter 1 and static notch filter 2. The dynamic notch really replaces the static notch filters which were introduced into Betaflight prior to the dynamic notch being available. Okay, so now that we have that out of the way, let's get into the meat of this thing. In my previous video, we talked about the Stage 1 and Stage 2 low-pass filters that are new, at least the Stage 2 is, in Betaflight 3.3. So what is a dynamic notch, and what, or just what is a notch filter? Well, a notch filter is really a low-pass filter, which is what we talked about before in the Stage 1 and Stage 2, and a high-pass filter used together. So it's really just flipping around a low-pass filter this would be called high pass filter where it attenuates low end noise but lets high frequency noise or motion through. So looking at the dynamic notch there's a couple key things. The dynamic notch just like a static notch has two basic frequencies that you can it operates with. With static notches you can set these yourself the dynamic it automatically does it hence the dynamic part that is the center cutoff frequency or the center frequency of the notch and then the lower cutoff frequency essentially the lower cutoff frequency is the cutter cutoff frequency for the low pass filter not the high pass filter the high pass filter cutoff frequency is set to be equivalent to whatever the distance is in hertz between the low pass cutoff filter and the center frequency so if this is 50 hertz differential this will be 50 hertz differential for a total of 100 hertz in breadth. What the dynamic notch does is detects peak motor noise and sets the center frequency right on top of it. And we'll show that here in a second. The lower cutoff has a range it can operate within. That's 120 hertz up to 200. The center frequency can operate from 130 hertz all the way up to 500. So as the motor noise in this spectrograph you can see is 121 Hertz so the center frequency is right on top of that and then the lower cutoff is all the way down to its lower limit. By default the dynamic notch tries to maintain a hundred Hertz differential between the lower cutoff and the center. You can see here that it's only 60 well, why? Because the motor noise is low enough that this is hitting up against its lower limit and it will not go down below 120 Hertz. As a result, this notch gets more narrow. As it narrows down, it can't cut as deep because obviously these two, the high, uh, the slope on the uh, high pass filter and the low pass filter stays the same. So as this high pass filter comes down, it, it doesn't allow a dynamic notch to attenuate as much at the center frequency. So going in this example, 180 hertz minus 120, that's 60 hertz differential, then you add another 60 to the high, and the, cut, the high pass cutoff frequency would be at 240 hertz. As the motor noise would move up, for example, and say our peak motor noise was here, so this would get attenuated, maybe I um, did a full throttle and then my peak motor noise moves up to around 300 Hertz then the dynamic notch will move up with it and it will also go out to be 100 Hertz between the lower cutoff frequency and the center frequency. Now as motor noise continues to increase in frequency and it's rare as I show here on the gray box general peak noise motor noise range is generally between 100 and I don't know, 130 the peak is usually not below 150 
as you can see in this example, this is 180, and this is just at a hover. But uh, when you are at higher throttle values, that's going to be even higher. Generally, it's around, I don't know, 260, 280, uh, usually between 250 and 300. So that's where your peaks are generally found. So it would be very rare that it would operate up here, but it does happen, as you'll see in a black box log here in a minute. Getting back to this, what happens here is this lower cutoff frequency will not be allowed to go above 200 hertz, but the center can go all the way up to 500. So you can see it can get very wide if it needs to. As it gets really wide here, it would cut really, really deep. Uh, I don't know exactly how deep, but the general is it cuts uh, negative 30 to 40 dB at 100 or at 200 hertz, uh, hertz total breadth, or 100 hertz between the cutoff and the center frequency. So obviously if the center frequency keeps going up and that gets to be uh, 600, you know, 100, 200, 300, so a total of 600 in total breadth, it would cut attenuate in a big way. So moving back to what general motor noise is, it's again, I would say anywhere from 260 to up to 300, depends on a lot of factors. But you can see here the default is 100 hertz that it tries to maintain from the center frequency of the dynamic notch to the lower cutoff. So as long as the dynamic notch can move anywhere within this area and the lower cutoff is operating within its lower and upper limit, it's going to stay at 100 hertz differential, so a 200 hertz total width. Generally at that width, it's cutting about 30 to 40 dB, which is much higher than low pass filters operating within this range. So the dynamic notch does a great job at killing motor noise. Here's an example from the developer of the dynamic notch on its attenuation. You can see here at a center frequency or the center uh, frequency of 260 Hertz and a low end cutoff at a, a hundred in the blue that's providing a wider notch which has a lower attenuation at the peak, higher in negative numbers, uh, lower line on the graph. As that the differential between the center frequency and the cu low cutoff frequency goes, and this is 100 hertz here just like the default, as that gets more narrow the attenuation gets less, but you can see we're still down at negative 40 dB. So depending where that goes, it can, you know, that, that attenuation can get more or less. So the next thing we're going to look at is some black box logs. If you want to look at what's going on with the dynamic notch, you need to run the debug mode FFT, which stands for Fast Fourier Transform. And there's different debug traces you can pull up. The zero trace is the raw gyro data that the dynamic notch is reading to first resample it and then set the center frequency. Trace 1 in your debug mode is the data after it's been passed through the dynamic notch. So we'll see this here in a second. There's also two other debug modes. There's an FFT frequency which then shows the roll, pitch, and yaw center frequencies for the dynamic notch and a debug mode time. We're not going to really get into this one. This is really hardcore development. But these other two are useful for just every day looking at what your dynamic notch is doing. And we'll talk about uh, why you'd want to look at that and, and compare it on the spreadsheet. What's important to note is that when we're looking at this debug mode, we're going to be looking at the raw data for the roll and the polished data or attenuated data for the roll. So that's the only things you can report on is the roll access. However, do note the dynamic notch is working on all three axes independently. So it's attacking the motor noise on the roll axis. At the same time, it's looking at the pitch axis and having different center frequencies. It's almost like three different things going on at the exact same time. Okay, so popping in the beta flight or butterflight, if you go in and type into the CLI and type get debug, you can see your different debug mode options. So the first thing one we're going to look at, at is the FFT debug mode. So to set that you would type set space debug underscore mode equals FFT, hit enter, 
type save and hit enter again. Then when you do that flight, it would record the FFT. You want to open up your black box log with black box explorer, go into your graph setup, and in there, you're going to go ahead and make a custom graph, hit the drop down, and come down to debug mode or debug all. In beta, if you're doing this is an older log with 3.2.1, newer logs, it would have the debug modes named. It wouldn't just be 0, 1, 2, and 3. It would have um, names associated with them, which correlates back. Notice uh, one little weird glitch here, at least in this log, if you're using an older version of Betaflight, this could happen no matter what. Um, it only shows me debug mode 3, but if I go back into graph setup and hit save again, then it's fine. So whatever, just be aware of that. Okay, so what are we looking at here? Well, as we showed before on the graphic, I'm going to try to put it down in the lower left-hand portion of the screen here, that debug mode 0 is the raw gyro data. So you can see it's very noisy. So we'll go ahead and look at that spectrograph. Look familiar? This was the plot that we were just looking at in the uh, PowerPoint. So you can see the raw gyro peak noise, motor noise, is 181 hertz. So let's go look at this after it's gone through the dynamic notch. So that would be debug node number one. And you can see there's a dramatic effect on how much it just crushes that motor noise. Nice and even across the whole spectrum. Anything above 100 hertz is totally tamped down. Uh, I can even bring up my scale slider a little bit and you can see I just have bass noise. I don't have any more peaks. So it does a great job. Honestly, these next two beat debug modes, I'm not going to go into detail. I don't see any real practical use unless you're you know, into the programming. So let's look at the next debug mode. So the next one we're going to look at is FFT frequency. So the same way you'd set that. Go ahead, save it. This would be the same way to set up a graph, custom graph, make a custom graph, add your debugs, and then you can see these are named at least with the 3.2.1, and I'm suspecting the same for if the log was uh, recorded with Betaflight 3.3. This is really nice because this shows us what the center frequency is for the roll, pitch, and yaw. And there's some really interesting things here you can look at. One of those is when, in this flight, when I drop to complete zero, at least on the yaw axis, it's going down to 130. Uh, the other two, the roll and pitch, my suspect is they're maintained up higher just because of the smoothing and the averaging. You know, they don't drop immediately. It's kind of a, an averaging that tries to not have the dynamic notch center frequency jump around as much. So that's why they stay up here. But um, what's nice to see is, you know, where are. So you can see as a general hover, um, I'm at around 228, 228, 231. And as I go into a punch out, you know, I'm getting up to... 332, 335, 328. So what's the practical use for this? Well, coming back to our handy dandy latency delay calculator, you can now have a more intelligent uh, understanding of where you should have your center cutoff frequency. And as you can see, it's dynamic, so it's gonna vary. But I'm really operating anywhere from, I don't know, 200 up to 325. So it really depends. Now I was able to, if you haven't downloaded this recently, I was able to program in that lower cutoff frequency. So if you can see, if I go to 180 hertz, this is not, the lower cutoff is not going to go below 120. Now look at my latency, how that goes up to 0.6. And if I get even lower, 150 hertz, that latency actually goes down. Wanted to go through the FFT, how to use it how you can get a sense of, hey, what, what is my dynamic notch operating? Obviously, you, this information is nothing direct you need to do, the dynamic notch, just by turning it on. But now you have a good sense of that cut, how much it's cutting out that peak motor, motor noise and, and how it's working. All right, guys. Thanks, and I hope this helped.